So since I'm already here, I'm going to start. Uh, I'm going to start with prayer, and then I have a, an extended Memorial Day welcome that we're going to give, a little sermonette. So you get two sermons for the price of one. Don't worry, we're not going to charge you for the second sermon. Okay? The second sermon is, is free. It's sort of like the coffee. We're not going to charge you for it. But um, the first the first sermon, mine, is, is worth paying for. So uh, y'all, y'all may want to pay for that one. No, I'm just kidding. All right, so here's, uh, let's go, let's pray. You guys uh, join me in prayer, please. God, thank you so much for giving us a, a glorious day. To be able to sit here and look in, at the expanse of what you've made is incredible, especially since we, we weren't sure about weather. And, and again, you've just uh, shown us a great day. So God, I thank you and I praise you for, uh, for your creation. I praise you for being the creator. I thank you for the life that you've given us. You're an amazing God. Uh, We don't give you enough glory. We don't give you enough honor. We don't give you enough credit. Uh, We should. And God, I pray that you will help us to glorify you on a daily basis. Today we're going to glorify you. God, I pray that you will accept our praise. I pray you will accept our praise in song, in the the word that's spoken, in the sermons that that are preached. God, in our fellowship today, we gather not... Not, not as a sign of freedom or not for our, our, our human holiday, Memorial Day, but as a memorial to you. And you've told us to meet together. So God, we honor you and we praise you. Pray that everything we do today redounds to your glory and your prosperity, not our own. Because your kingdom is great. And I pray that it will come. You're an amazing God. Thank you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Hey, you know, there's one thing you did forget to mention. Uh-oh. I know it's not Resurrection Sunday, but if you remember last time, uh-huh. uh, we had this little thing, if they agreed with you or something like that. Do you remember what they did? Honk if you agree. Honk if you agree. Or it was an amen. There we go. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So those are your a- those are your amen horns. Those are your okay. amen horns. Those are yeah. your amen horns. I, I had to make sure you mentioned that. Yeah. I mean, that was your idea. Right on. That's right. It's an amen horn. <laughs> or if you're not close to your horn, you can just give a yeehaw, uh, or something like that as well. Yeah. That's all right. All right. So again, if you if you just came in, and if you want a cup of coffee, cup, coffee is delivered free. Get text the word mocha to the address nine four zero 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 nine four thousand. It will guide you through. Put your your uh, parking spot number on that on that order form. Our neighbors in the neighborhood, if you want a coffee delivered, just put your address. All right, so that's where we go. So uh, it is Memorial Day, and uh, it's a special day for many people. It's a special day for my family. My wonderful wife uh, served in the served in the Navy, so we got the pleasure of seeing military life. Uh, many of you, many of the people behind me uh, and in front of me you guys served in the military also memorial day weekend is something we need to think about god put us here uh, not for ourselves but to remember people it's not a day of vacation it is a day of remembrance today the bible is full of those memories as well people remember their uh, lost ones but they also built memorials to them you'll see in the scripture a lot of times where uh, someone died and they built a, a, a rock monument or or um, they were buried in a special uh, tree, the, the oak of Mamre, or, or, the, or caves where they would have things built as memorials. You see with people, you have Noah that it said he remembers people. Abraham remembers, and uh, Jacob, and Moses, and David, and Joshua. They list the people, whether they were friends with them and they lost them, or in the case of Joshua, and David, and Moses, the people that they fought in battle with and they they lost them in the battle uh whenever whenever david lost jonathan uh he he mourned and so we we know that this that that mourning and remembering is a biblical concept uh god also is a part of that god says he remembers oftentimes he says i and i remembered my people he says i remembered my covenant uh and so for whether it is for for God remembering His people and His covenant, or if it's with us remembering uh, our our friends, our family, our loved ones, the idea of remembering our past and the people in our past, it's a solid biblical truth. So we need to embrace it uh, and appreciate it. So how do we do that as we gather together as the active body of Christ? That's the question I want to bring. So I want to make two suggestions and then come to a, a conclusion, a necessity, I think I should say, instead of a conclusion. Here are the two suggestions. First, remember the deceased. Second, remember the living. How do we remember the, the deceased? Well, let me read from Romans chapter 1. He says, um, Paul says, First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you because your faith is being reported all over the world. 
Now, the reason that their faith was being reported is because a lot of them were, were dying for their faith. Rome was not a safe place for a believer. If you understand the time frame within which Paul was writing, Christians were being tortured, sacrificed. They were being used as torches. Uh, gasoline or, or uh, burning liquid oil was being poured on them and they were being lit and posted as, as torches in gardens. It was not a good time. So how is their faith being reported? Because <clears throat> they were dying for their faith. And so Paul looks at them and says, these things are being reported all over the world, but the God of whom I serve with my whole heart in preaching the gospel of a son is my witness how constantly I remember you. So he remembers them. Let me tell you, on Memorial Day weekend, we should look back and remember people. We should remember the deceased. I'm going to put it in three categories. De deceased friends. Many of us have friends who have made a tremendous impact on our lives. We should remember those friends and we should bless them by the, the continued way we live our lives because they impacted our lives. We have deceased family members, and those people molded your life. Your life will never be the same because of, because of what they did, whether good or bad. We learn many things from the bad things that happened, not just the good. Sometimes you learn what not to do, and, you've, and you then incorporate that into your life so that that way you don't make those same mistakes again. Sometimes you learn what to do. Whatever it is, these deceased family members, we remember them. We should honor them. Deceased veterans, whom this day is typically for, those are people who've provided freedom for your life. So we have some that impacted your life, some that molded your life. But our veterans, they provided freedom for your life. Remember them. Honor them. Originally, Memorial Day was set up to honor the dead in the Civil War. But over the years, it's become a time when we remember not just the Civil War deceased, but veterans from throughout all of our, all of our time as a country. All of our uh, past soldiers and our recently lost solar, soldiers, sailors, airmen, and marines. We should remember those who have deceased, but we also should remember those who are living as well. Those friends who are currently impacting our lives. Maybe there's friends who have impacted your lives and you're now estranged from them or you haven't seen them for a while. Remember them. Reach out to them. Tell them on this day of memorial, I want to remember you. Call them. Reestablish that friendship so that either they can have impact again on your life or you can have impact on theirs. Those family members who are, <clears throat> who are still molding our lives, remember them. Honor them. Many of us have broken relationships even with families. Reach out to them. Uh, even if it's, a, if it's a painful something, don't, don't reach out to them to, to twist the knife and say this was a painful thing and how dare you have done this. But reach them out to honor them. Tell them how you've incorporated some of those pains into your life. Uh, forgive them. Reach out in forgiveness. Forgiveness is a powerful tool. It's a very interesting tool, too. The person who forgives is the one who has the power. If you want to retain power in your relationship, forgive. Reach out. Take the power back by forgiving the person who might have wronged you. Those family members who are still molding your lives, remember them. Reach out to them. Honor them. And then those military members who, who today are still securing our freedom. The freedom for your life and the lives of the billions of people around the world that, that our military so wonderfully does, uh, for, that we provide help for and freedom for. They're the legacy that's left behind by, the, by, the, by those who came before them and died before them. Honor them. They have earned our respect. They've earned our appreciation. They've earned our encouragement. Don't just say in your heart, I, I remember them and I thank them. Tell them that you appreciate them. They've earned that encouragement, not just today, but every day. Remember them. Honor them. Then there is one last brief category. <clears throat> and this is an odd category because we should, believe, we should remember the one who belongs to both categories. The one who is deceased and the living, that is Jesus Christ. Jesus battled sin. He was a warrior. Jesus defeated our enemy and He set us free. He set us free from the tyranny of enslavement to sin. He conquered our foe. The battle cost Him His life, and so we should remember His death because His death molds our life. It provides the ultimate freedom for our life. It impacts us on a daily basis. Jesus not only died, but He lives today, so He fits into the second category. Jesus lives today, and though His battle resulted in death, Death was just another foe, foe, and he likewise defeated death as well. When you place your faith, when you place your life 
in the life of Jesus, he says this, Do you not know that all of us have been, who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into His death? We were buried, therefore, with Him by this baptism and death, in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with Him in a death like His, we shall certainly be united with Him in a resurrection like His. You see, Memorial, Memorial Day is not just looking back and saying, gee, I, I'm thankful for those soldiers, sailors, airmen, and marines who gave their lives. I'm not just thankful for them, but I'm united with them because the, the country that we live in today is because of their sacrifice. We've been united with them in their death. However, we've not been united with them in their life. <clears throat> we have, though, been united with Christ in His death and therefore His resurrection. So just like Memorial Day, we've been united as a country because of the death of our soldiers, sailors, airmen, and marine. We are united in Christ because He died. Then He conquered death and He's given us that same life. So today I want us to remember. Remember those deceased who formed you, who gave you freedom. And remember those who are alive, who guide you and sustain your freedom. But the utmost, remember Jesus who provides the utmost life and the utmost freedom. Let's pray, and Tim, I'm going to hand it over to you after that, okay? God, you're a great God. Thank you so much for what you've done. God, I thank you for my country. I thank you for our country. Um, I thank you for the, the lives that we see in the past. They did not die in vain. Uh, God, I thank you for the experiment that you've planted here on this earth. I pray that, that we will honor that on this day. Uh, through the honoring of our soldiers, sailors, airmen, and marines. God, you're, you're a great God. I, I praise you for the foundation of this country and for the sacrifices they gave, but I praise you also for the sacrifice that you gave, not to unite us in a country, but you, to unite us into something that is greater and grander than anything we could ever dream, and that is your kingdom. God, I thank you for allowing us to be united in the death of Christ without having to suffer it. And I thank you for allowing us to be united in resurrection of Christ. And so we get entrance into your freedom and the authority to be called sons and daughters of the living God. We owe you everything, the least of which is our life. God, you're a great God. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Horn, horn. God doesn't uh, just want us to survive through this uh, difficult time. Thanks, Hoyt. Um, Sorry. <laughs> he not, not only wants us to survive, but he wants us to thrive in our relationships with others and our relationship with him. Um, I love the, the start of that course is just to know you and to make you known. We lift your name on high. That's what we want to do this morning. Amen. Can I hear an amen? There we go. All right, let's sing out. Many a dream has died Like a tree planted by the water We never will run dry So living water flowing through God be thirst for more of you Fill our hearts and flood our souls In one desire Just to Deep, to 
into a father's heart Into the world we're reaching out To show them who you are So living water flowing through God be thirst for more of you Fill our hearts and flood our souls With one desire Just to know Anything is possible, joy unspeakable, faith unsinkable, love unstoppable, anything is possible, joy unspeakable, faith unsinkable, love unstoppable, anything is possible, joy unspeakable, faith unsinkable, love unstoppable, anything is possible, just to know you and to make you known we lift your name on high shine like the sun make darkness run and hide we know we were made for so much more than ordinary lives it's time for us to more than just survive we were made to thrive, yeah. Oh, 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 we were made to thrive. Amen. Amen.
covering of your grace as sinful humans, Father. We're so thankful for your free sacrifice, for your free gift of life, for each breath that you give us daily, God. We're reminded of your grace. We are so undeserving, yet you love us, God. So this morning, we beg for your forgiveness. God, we don't want to abuse your grace. God, we want to be more like Jesus every day. Father, help us stay steadfast. Help us run this race with endurance, Father. Lead us in your spirit. Help us touch those who need you, God. Lord, let us walk in love and not judgment. Let's sing this out. We don't want to abuse your grace, Father. I don't want to abuse your grace. God, I need it every day. It's the only thing that ever really makes me want to change. I don't want to abuse your grace. God, I need it every day. It's the only thing that ever
pray together. God, thank you so much that you are a God that is present with us in our very uh, time of need. Father, we, we thank you for this wonderful time of connecting with you, whether it's talking about those that we remember or, Father, singing songs to you. God, it's not about our voices. It's not about how we sing. But, God, it's about giving you the worship that you are worthy of. So, Father, I pray as we open up your word this morning that we understand it's not just a book, but we understand that it is your holy inspired word, that it brings power and love. God, it, it, it can call us out. So, Father, that's what we're praying to happen this morning. May we feel loved as you reveal your word to us, but, God, may we also be revealed to who we are compared to you. That your holy inspired word penetrates straight to our hearts and continues to make us to strive to thrive to be more like you instead of maybe just sustaining to survive in this world. And so in your name we pray. Amen. So I'm going to try something new this morning, all right? Um, there's, there's going to be one point I'm going to try to have you all remember before you leave here today, okay? So I'm going to say it a couple times. I'm going to ask you almost to repeat it to yourself in your car, or if you're sitting outside, you can do that as well, okay? But here is the simple saying that we're going to try to memorize this, uh, this morning, or you even want to say this afternoon, this wonderful weather outside today, all right? So here's a statement. God works on my spiritual maturity, not my personal comfort. All right? I'm going to say it again a couple of times, but I want you to start trying to think about that yourself, and then we're going to try to memorize it so we can leave with something here today. All right? Here it is again. God works on my spiritual maturity, not my personal comfort. I'll say it one more time, and then I want you to try to say it back with me, all right? Here we go. God works on my spiritual maturity, not on my personal comfort. Now, I'm going to have you repeat it back to me, but I really want you to repeat it back to me with some authority, all right? I don't need you to honk your horns or anything like that, but I want you to do it with some authority where you actually believe this statement if you believe it to be true. So you just kind of say it whispering or whatever like that, you're not going to... You're not going to remember it. But if you truly believe this to be true, and we will talk about this, how this is true more, I want you to say it with some authority in your cars or if you're sitting outside, all right? Here we go. Ready? God works on my spiritual maturity, not on my personal comfort. All right. So we're going to look at Daniel chapter 4 today. If you can open up to that, that would be great. Daniel chapter 4, if you're visiting with us or you haven't been here in a couple weeks or if you're watching online, we do say you're, we're glad you're with us as well. But we've been studying the book of Daniel now for a couple of weeks and our main statement that we've been trying to see is that we are striving to thrive while we're just trying to or sustaining to survive in this world. And what a timely it, time it is to be going through the book of Daniel in this whole pandemic or corona or unfamiliar kind of thing because, you know, it is a time. We're, we're trying to thrive or we're striving to thrive when we don't know how we're supposed to survive sometimes. I thank you um, for your patience and your prayers. As Hoyt mentioned before, our leadership team is awesome. If you guys don't know this, I am so thankful for a group of men that, that care about not just this church, but every single one of you sitting out here today or online, they are prayerfully considering, hey, how are we going to reopen? But they're trying to do it the best that they can to say, hey, when we get together as a church, we want to get together as a church. We don't want to just get here and have stipulations. We want to worship like we're coming to church. And man, I am so thankful for a group of men that prayerfully consider this and are looking at all the opportunities, all the options of what we're going to do. And I'm so thankful for that because they are looking to thrive. They're not just looking to, you know, let's get back into the building and do what we got to do. They are looking what's best for all of us, that we can be a church that thrives, not just survives through this whole thing. So if you know who they are, just make sure you say thanks because they really are leading well. All right. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to read the book of Daniel. And I think there's some really... Daniel 4, and I think there's some really good things that we're going to see here today out of this chapter, all right? So Daniel chapter 4 is where we're going to start in verse 
1. Here's what it says. It says, King Nebuchadnezzar to all the peoples, nations, and languages that dwell in all the earth, peace be multiplied to you. It has seemed good to me to show the signs and the wonders that the Most High God has done for me. How great are his signs, how mighty his wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and his dominion endures from generation to generation. Now we could just stop there. And that could be our whole message for today, because if you remember we, what we studied last week with Nebuchadnezzar, he was a man that is all about himself, all about his rule, all about his power, all about his authority. And if you remember correctly, last week in chapter 3, he was so full of himself that he built this statue. And it wasn't just a small statue that we would see maybe sitting on this table. It measured to be 90 feet high. And do you know what it was? It was a gold image of himself. And if you remember correctly, what happened was he said that everybody, as soon as the music starts playing, I need you to get on your knees and I need you just to start worshiping the statue. You want to talk about an arrogant man, this is the guy. He is very, very prideful. And how this chapter starts is it's not just about him worshiping God, but it's about him saying to all of this empire, to all of Babylon, he is basically saying, hey, I'm holding a press conference for everybody to hear. All right, this is him saying, hey, um, here's a coronavirus thing. We're holding a press conference to talk about what's going to happen. He is holding a press conference for all of the world, for all of the nation to hear. And here's what he says. He talks about the kingdom of God being the kingdom that lasts forever. That is not how you think that this prideful, arrogant man would start out a letter to everybody that he's speaking about. But he did. And he's making it clear that I have a very important message for you to hear. He's going to tell us a story. So the first point that we see here, that we're going to look at is in, in, four, in verses 4 through kind of 18-ish, is I want you to know today that personal comfort, your own personal comfort, it can be capped. There is a certain point to where your personal comfort can get to where it can't get anymore. And that's what Nebuchadnezzar is going to talk about here. Verse 4, it says, I, Nebuchadnezzar, or King Nebi as we like to call him here, I, King Nebi, was at ease in my house and prospering in my palace. I saw a dream that made me afraid. As I lay in my bed, the fancies and the visions of my head, they alarmed me we got to stop here and talk about, so we're talking about our personal comfort being capped. You see how King Nebuchadnezzar first starts this whole passage with praising God, but then he talks about his, his own palace. He talks about his own ease. He talks about his own comfort that he was in his palace, he was at ease. So he's probably talking about a little bit, this is my whole kingdom. This is my comfort. This is my palace. This is amazing. This is awesome. And he's saying, I was at ease in my house, and I was prospering in my place. In other words, I'm getting everything that I need, far more than that. Look at all the work that I have done. This is all about me, and I am at ease. You ever been to a part in your life where you're like that, where you're just... You're, you're so at ease with everything that's going on in your life or you're maybe at ease with everything that is, is happening or everything that you have where you just think it's, it's about all the things that you have accomplished. And that's kind of where King Nebuchadnezzar is. He's basically saying I'm at ease because of everything that I have done. I've turned this Babylon empire from nothing to where it was before to being the most powerful empire in all of the world. And I'm at ease. I have possessions. I have a family. I have all of these things. Maybe some of you are saying I have a sweet car. I got a sweet, sweet ride. I got a nice house. I'm at ease. I'm at comfort because of all of this. But being King Nebuchadnezzar, the arrogant man that he is, the powerful man that he is, the next, how chapter, uh, verse 5 starts, is by him simply saying, I saw a dream that made me afraid. 
And maybe this is how it all maybe starts for you too, right? We see everything going so well, and then all of a sudden some kind of vision or, or something happens where it feels that everything has crumbled away. And for King Nebuchadnezzar, it is a dream that has made him terrified. And he is not a man that backs down easily. We've seen this, right? We saw it in chapter 2. He had a dream before. And he said to all of his important fellows that he's been raising up, he says, I need you to tell me my dream and then I need to you to interpret it. And if you can't do that, you will die. That's how bad he was. We talked about in chapter 3. He's this powerful man that he wants all respect and control, so he builds himself a statue where you will respect my authority and you will worship me. He's all powerful. He's raging with fury, though. He's raging. He's mad. And here we see that he is afraid and he is scared because God is revealing to him something in a dream. So he says, I saw a dream that made me afraid, and as, as I lay in bed and the fancies and the visions of my head, they alarmed me. So I made a decree that all the wise men of Babylon should be brought before me that they might make known to me the interpretation of the dream. You've seen that? He's doing again what he did in chapter 2. He's calling all of, all of his boys that he's trained up for a long time. And he says, then the magicians, the enchanters, the Chaldeans, and the astrologers, they came in and I told them the dream, but they could not make known for me its interpretation. And then it says in, in verse 8, at last... Daniel came in before me. Y'all, why do we do this? Why in the world did he wait for Daniel to be the last one to enter in? Was he not the one two chapters ago that revealed all of these, this dream? Not only did he interpret it for him, but he revealed it. He said, this is what your dream was. Here's what it means. Why did he wait for Daniel last? Why wouldn't he call for Daniel first? And we laugh at this and we say, yeah, why is that? And the, the bottom line factor is, is we do the same thing in our relationship with God. We try to figure out everything we can by ourselves. And then when we're on our breaking point, when we're kind of like, man, this just isn't working, that's when we call upon God. Why? Why don't we go to a first? Why don't we go to the men of God? Why don't we go to a man of God first? But it says at last, Daniel came in before. He was named Belt, uh, Belshazzar. That's his name now. After the name, my God. That's, uh, that is Nebuchadnezzar's God. And in whom is the spirit of the holy gods. And I told him the dream. And here's his dream. It says, O Belshazzar, chief of the magicians, because I know that the spirit of the holy gods is in you and that no mystery is too difficult for you, tell me the visions of my dream that I saw in their interpretation. The visions of my head as I lay in bed were these. I saw and behold a tree in the midst of the earth, and its height was great. The tree grew and became strong, and its top reached to heaven. And it was visible to the end of the whole earth. Its leaves were beautiful, and its fruit abundant, and in it was food for all. The beasts of the field found shade under it, and the birds of the heavens, they lived in its branches, and all flesh was fed from it. I saw in the visions of my head as I lay in bed, and behold, a watcher, a holy one, came down from heaven. He proclaimed aloud and said thus, Chop down the tree and lop off its branches, strip it of its leaves and scatter its fruit, let the beasts flee from under it and the birds from its branches. But this voice, this voice above all, it says, But leave the stump of its roots in the earth, bound with a band of iron and bronze amid the tender grass of the field. Let him be wet with the dew of heaven. Let the portion of the beast be in the grass of the earth. Let this mind be changed from man's, and let a beast's mind be given to him, and let seven periods of time pass over him. This is his dream. So vivid. So real. And so he's saying, this is, this is terrifying to me. This is frightening to me. Daniel, will you please come help? Because nobody else can tell me what's going on. But it is keeping me awake at night. It's eating me alive. I am the most powerful man in the world. And this is terrifying to me. Daniel, help me. See, King Nebi was afraid. He was terrified because he understands that his possessions, they couldn't bring him comfort. And maybe some of you need to hear that today, that what you have is not going to bring you comfort forever. His rage, 
He couldn't fury somebody into this. He couldn't kill somebody over this to make himself feel better. I sure hope you're not doing that. His own personal strength couldn't make this go away. May some of you need to hear that today. You can't will what's going on in your life away. Maybe it's because of what we first said. That God works on my spiritual maturity, not on my personal comfort. So let's look at the second point here. And this is in verse 19. And it simply is that God may send someone to reveal your wrong before he knocks you down. God may send someone to you to reveal your wrong before he knocks you down. And the question is, how would you respond? How would you respond to that? Verse 19, then Daniel, whose name was Belteshar, was dismayed for a little while. In other words, he's disturbed. He's, something's going on. He's, he's dismayed. He's, he's disgusted. He feels horrible. He felt horrible for a while, and his thoughts, they alarmed him. The king answered and said, let not the dream or the interpretation alarm you. Belshazzar or Daniel, he answered and he said, My Lord, may the dream be for those who hate you and its interpretation for your enemies. And here Daniel goes into this is what it means. He says, A tree you saw which grew and became strong so that its top reached to heaven and it was visible to the end of the whole earth whose leaves were beautiful and its fruit abundant and in which was food for all under the, which the beasts of the field found shade and in those branches the birds of heavens lived. He says, it is you. It is you, O king, who have, who have grown and become strong. Your greatness has grown and reaches to the heaven and your dominion to the ends of the earth. You, you see what Daniel's doing? He's, he's telling him this, this tree that you built, this tree that you saw, this is you. Because you've worked so hard for this. This is exactly what you think it is. This tree is, 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 is you. But have you ever had this where somebody that knows they've got to call something out on you, they, they kind of start by telling you the good things about you, and, and then he gets to verse 23, and because the king saw a watcher, a holy one coming down from heaven and saying, chop down the tree and destroy it, but leave the stump and its roots on the earth, bound with a band of iron and bronze in the tender grass of the field, and let him be wed with the dew of the heaven. Let his portion be with the beasts of the field till seven periods of time pass over him. And Daniel says, O king, O king Nebuchadnezzar, this, this dream that you had, which has come, come upon you, you're going to be driven away from among men, and your dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field. Listen to this. You shall be made to eat grass like an ox, and you shall be wet with the dew of heaven, and seven periods, seven years of time shall pass over you till you know that the Most High rules the kingdom of men and gives it to whom he will. In other words, he's saying, hey, um, the tree that's standing, it's, it's going to be cut down. Its power is going to be taken from him. And you're going to be like an ox eating grass. You're going to be like a beast on the field. You're going to get wet from the dew because you're going to be going cray-cray in your mind. King Nebuchadnezzar, you're going to go batty. You're going to go crazy. It's going to happen. And so Daniel makes a plea with him. And he says in verse 26, And it was commanded to leave the stump and the roots of the tree. Your kingdom shall be confirmed for you from that time. You know that the heaven rules. We will come back to that, but listen to verse 27. Therefore, O king, let my counsel be acceptable to you. Break off your sins by practicing righteousness and your iniquities by showing mercy to the oppressed that there may perhaps be a lengthening of your prosperity. Daniel is pleading with the king. He's saying, change your ways. Change your sins. You, I'm calling out your sin. I'm telling you what you're doing wrong. Stop practicing wrong. Stop practicing your own kingdom. Stop only performing for yourself. And see that the eternal God is calling you out to go for righteousness, to do what is right. You know what's right, to not choose what is wrong. Change your ways, 
now, Daniel is saying, and God may change his mind yet. You know, um, a couple years ago, I lived in the uh, town of Monroe, and a good friends of ours, Matt and Rachel, they live over there in Monroe, and uh, Miranda and I were there a couple weeks ago, and I don't know if you know this, but almost all uh, highways have some kind of construction going on right now. Does that not stink? It drives me crazy. But here's what I thought. I knew how to get back onto the highway to get back home. So I'm taking the exit and I see a big sign that says road closed ahead. And Miranda goes, hey, you probably shouldn't go that way because the road is closed and you're not going to be able to get on the highway to get back home. And I go, no, 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 I, I know how to get home. I know that I'm going to be able to get through. So I'm just going to keep on going. And if it's not, right, I said if it's not there, it says road closed ahead, they'll have some kind of detour to point me which way to go. Well, as we start driving, I'm, I'm thinking, you know what, I said road closed ahead, but where is it that the road closed ahead? I don't see it. And suddenly we're getting there, and there it is. Big old barricades you cannot get through. So I have a choice right now, right? I have a choice to either kind of go back a little bit and take a road that I have no idea where I'm taking, or I can go all the way back to where it said road closed ahead, and I can go a different way that I would know. Look, this is what Daniel is saying to him now. Up ahead, road closed ahead. It is dangerous if you keep living the way that you are. Yo, know, we have people in our lives, hopefully, that will do this for you. Hey, the life that you're living, it's not right. You're going sin. You are choosing yourself. It, you're going down a road that is closed ahead, and you are going to go crazy pretty soon. God says so. But we have a choice. You see, Nebuchadnezzar was too prideful to listen to Daniel. You see, sin is desiring each one of us. Its desire is to not make you feel better or give you more things. Its desi desire is to destroy you. Sin wants you to ignore the warning signs. Sin wants you to follow your gut, to follow your heart, to do what you got to do. You, sin is telling you, you deserve this. Sin is telling you, if you wanted something, you got to take it for yourself. But Proverbs 16, 18 reminds us that pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Here's what we're going to see in the next part of this passage. And this is what hurts. Sometimes God knocks us on our backs. We can even say our butts if we want. Sometimes God knocks us on our backs or our butts so that all we can do is look up. And this is what we're going to see happening to Nebuchadnezzar. All this came upon, verse 28, upon King Nebuchadnezzar. And at the end of 12 months, after a year this was all talked about, he was walking on the roof of his royal palace in Babylon. And the king answered and said, It is not this, it is not this great Babylon which I have built by my mighty power as a royal residence and for the glory of my majesty. <laughs> Look what I did here. Look what I did. Nebuchadnezzar is still full with pride all about himself what, what he built not that God put him there but that he built it says while the words were still in the king's mouth there fell a voice from heaven and it said oh King Nebuchadnezzar to you it is spoken the kingdom has departed from you and we can continue on this but what happens is King Nebuchadnezzar, the kingdom is then stripped from him for seven years and he goes and he eats grass like an ox and he crawls on the ground like a beast. In other words, he's gone completely mad and crazy. Sin has totally took control of him. And he's, I'm, I'm, I'm not just saying crazy as like a, a word statement here. I am saying mental hospital, loony bin, absolutely psychiatric ward nasty crazy man no hope that's where Nebuchadnezzar went so see the message that I think that God is having to say to us is that sometimes we got to be knocked down on our butts 
and everything's stripped away from us sometimes, and we don't want to hear that, but sometimes it's true that all of this will be taken away from us because God works on our spiritual maturity, not on our personal comfort. But you all told you there was a message here that God said that there will remain a stump in the roots. And God had a plan. And His grace action was going to come in. Here's how this passage ends. It says, At the end of the days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, I lifted my eyes to the heaven. In other words, he was on his back. He was on his butt. All he could do was look up to God. And my reason returned to me. In other words, my sanity came back to me. And I bless the Most High and I praise and honor Him who lives forever for His dominion is an everlasting dominion and His kingdom endures from generation to generation. This is King Nebuchadnezzar. His king kingdom was completely stripped away. And I'm saying to you right now, God may remove your kingdom as well that you have tried to build so wonderfully for yourself. Because He's after your spiritual maturity. He's not after your personal comfort. But verse 35, it says, All the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing, and he does according to his will among the hosts of heaven, and among the inhabitants of the earth, and none can stay his hand or say to him, What have you done? No one can question God, because he's in control of everything. But it says at the end, At the same time my reason returned to me, and for the glory of my kingdom, my majesty and splendor, it returned to me. My counselors and my Lord sought me, and I was established in my kingdom, and still more greatness was added to me. Y'all, even though branches may be cut and pruned, God's going to leave a stump with thick roots to show He's got a restoration plan for your life. You know, I'm not a, a very good gardener. I found that out over the past couple of weeks. But um, one thing I did find out is that when things appear to be dead, they're not always dead. They just need time to grow. Miranda was telling me, she said, hey, uh, there's a bush that needs to be removed. And I said, well, I don't think it's dead yet. So I, I trimmed it down. You know, you pruned it down and it's almost to the nothing. And Miranda's like, man, just go get the truck and rip those roots out. It's completely dead. And I was like, I don't know. And I, I, don't, I don't really know how to do that, honestly. But here's the deal, that, that bush that you know I trimmed way down because we thought was dead is now budding up with beautiful flowers on the corner of our house, and it's absolutely gorgeous. You know, the same thing happened to Nebuchadnezzar. He was completely stripped of everything, all of his, only down to the roots. Only down to the roots. I think her alarm is going off, you know? But that was an amen thing, yeah all down to the roots but y'all even if you're stripped of everything that you have god still got a restoration plan for your life and that's what nebuchadnezzar is telling you and that's what god is telling us here today his kingdom was given back after seven years that's that's unheard of god's restoration plan for nebuchadnezzar is saying i still have plans for you and i am telling you that today even if everything that you have may be taken away even if everything you fought up for so hard is taken away God still has a restoration plan for you because He's more about your spiritual maturity than your personal comfort. So please, instead of having to go batty, instead of having to go crazy, instead of having to go like Nebuchadnezzar went down and, and had to be completely pruned down and removed all of the things, y'all, there are people in your life that are speaking into you and saying, hey, the life that you are living is not good the life that you're living i i don't know you say you're following christ I, I don't really know if you are or not because the fruit that you are producing is not showing that y'all listen listen to them because god may have sent them to help with your spiritual maturity but if not god will still get your attention because he's after your spiritual maturity, not your personal comfort. Man, you know, some of us may be sitting here, because this, this is what I'm going to end on, so worship team, you want to come back up, you can. Some of you may be sitting here and be like, man, that's so discouraging. That's so discouraging that, that there would be a God that would do that, that would take away all my stuff just for my spiritual maturity. But I want to tell you something that's simple. 
Your life here on earth is only for a limited time. It's only for, you know, for lucky, what, 80 years, 100 years? I mean, I don't hope I live to 100 years because that just doesn't sound good. But let's be honest. We have an amount of time that we are here, so why in the world would he only fight for your good here in this world when your eternal life is forever? Y'all, that's why I'm saying to you today that God is after your spiritual maturity, not your personal comfort here on earth. Because he's an eternal God, he's not a world God. So maybe some of you are sitting here today and you just need to do that. Maybe you just need to fall on your backs or on your butts because you all you want to do, all you can do is look up. And I beg you, if that's what you need to do, do it here this morning. But don't let it forget that God hasn't left you. God is not forsaking you. If something that you have fought for or something you really wanted, you didn't get, it's not God saying, ah, I don't really care for that one. He's after your spiritual maturity. He's after your eternal life. Not your worldly possessions, not your, not your comfort, not your personal comfort. Praise to the Lord for that. Let's pray. God, thank you for this morning. Thank you for the wonderful weather that you've given us, that we are able to praise you here today. God, we're even thankful that you gave us this whole corona thing. I know that's weird for us to say. But God, what a way to see that you still remain in control of this world, even though it seems that it has lost control a bit. God, thank you for giving us opportunities to worship you. Maybe they're unfamiliar for us, but God, we are so amazed that we still get to worship you. God, I pray for the one person here today, maybe for many of us, that God, we say we've given you all of our hearts, but the bottom line is, God, we're even scared to give you 5%. And we, want, we, we, we think that it's all about the more prosperity, the more things that we get here in this world, the more that you care about us. But God, that's not what it's about. You're about maturing us spiritually, not giving us a whole bunch of stuff. So God, we're going to make a tough prayer here. God, if you need to remove some of this stuff in my life, that you may mature me spiritually to be more like you. God, we want to be more like you, so God, would you do that? It's a hard prayer to make, but God, we want to be more likely, like you. So if you need to remove something from my life right now, for me to see that it's not about my personal comfort, but it's about maturing me in faith with you, God, I trust you. I trust you to do that. We love you. In your name we pray. Amen. I know each and every one of us are going through different areas in our lives, different circumstances to get back to normalcy. But I pray that we're able to fix our eyes on Jesus, just like Pastor Jesse was saying. And realize that he only, he's the only one who's going to be able to bring true peace to our circumstances, to our families, to our households, to our workspace. I don't know if you're scared. I don't know if you're stressed. Just being completely real with God today. Let's find our satisfaction and our peace in the storm. In Jesus' name. Peace. Bring it all to peace. The storm surrounding me. Let it break.
gonna we're gonna sing one more song here together. Hey, we're gonna sing one more song here together, okay? And I just want this to be a response. Um, it's just a, an older song. It's called "We Fall Down." But I want you to ask yourself: Can you put down your crowns? Can you put down what you've been fighting for? Can you put down what maybe your kingdom is? And can you lay it down at the feet of Jesus? And look up and see His restoration plan for you and your life. Let's make this our prayer as we end our service here this morning. Thank you guys so much for coming this morning. We hope that as you come here today, you just get a little piece, a glimpse of God's glory being shown around this place. As we've been able to say amen and honk and, and celebrate with one another what it means uh, to live a life in relationship with one another horizontally and live a life in relationship with God vertically. Just take an opportunity uh, today with your family to just worship together uh, with your family uh, over lunch and throughout the day and just be thankful for where we're at and being able to celebrate together. Um, let's, let's just pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this day. We thank you for this opportunity that you've given to us to gather together. Lord, as we continue to practice social distancing and, and just being smart about what we're doing, we thank you and praise you. Lord, you are sovereign, and we don't take anything away from that. We praise you for who you are. And God, we just ask that you would give us a great day to serve you. And all God's people said, Peace.
Amen. Have a great day, guys. God bless you. Amen.